Um, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Penny Satori, who did her PhD in near-death studies. I think that's the topic, isn't it? At Lambertie University. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Penny, do you want to tell us a little bit about your background, how you got involved in this? Initially? Yeah, well, I started off working as a nurse. I started my training in 1989. Um, when I qualified, I worked in various departments, and then I ended up in intensive care. And I really liked the work, I loved it, and I stayed there for 17 years in the end. Um, I think it was early on in my career that I became really interested in death. What happens when we die, you know, is uh, having looked after a man who had quite a prolonged death, it really kind of upset me. And um, I just started reading about death all the time and wherever I went I had a book on death in my hand. And I came across near-death experiences and I just thought, wow, these people are saying that death is a lovely experience, it's amazing. And I thought, hmm, I'd like to know more about this. But I think my, my scientific background as a nurse and my nurse training had kind of told me that these experiences were just some sort of hallucination. Or maybe it's the brain as it's shutting down, as it's approaching death. And I think my curiosity got the better of me, really. And um, I decided that I wanted to do a study in near-death experiences. And I contacted Professor Paul Badham at Lampeter University because at the time he was the only person in Britain who I knew who was familiar with near-death experiences. And uh, it kind of went from there, but I was lucky enough as well to have Dr Peter Fenwick from London, who's a neurophysiologist, neuropsychiatrist, and he was my second supervisor for the PhD. So I had, I had two very different supervisors, so it was coming from two very different angles really. So I was really lucky to be able to do the research. Excellent. So um, you came, as you said, from a scientific background. Mm -hmm. So why do you think, Penny, that there is this fear of death in the, in the Western world? I think it's just something that we never think about as a society. We don't talk about death. When I was growing up, I was told that death is something you don't talk about. And if anyone I knew died, we were told not to discuss death. And I think it's kind of been instilled with us, really. Mm. Whereas other cultures think very differently, you know. With other cultures, death is a part of life. It certainly is. Yeah, that's right. And it's very much embraced as well. And, and so I think in the West, we're very much alienated from death. And it's, it's a very taboo topic. Okay. Could you tell us the sort of things that mainly happen in a near-death experience? The sort right. of overall things. I think you've got quite a few interesting... Yeah. If you, if you, if you, perhaps if you run through a standard... Um, a near death experience. Right, well, the out of, uh, first of all, the near death can, experience can start with maybe an out of body experience where the person is approaching death or they're suddenly in a life threatening circumstances. They feel like they separate from their body and clearly exist apart from it. So they're looking down on the situation and in many cases they feel that the real them is up there by the ceiling and it's just a shell that's on the bed or on the road, wherever the body is. Um, then they may go through a dark tunnel towards a bright light at the end and very often they'll feel drawn towards that light, almost like a magnetic quality. And if they get into the light, they find themselves sometimes in beautiful gardens with lush green grass, vividly coloured flowers, sometimes there's a stream in the background. And they can meet dead relatives and sometimes they meet dead relatives or friends who they didn't know to be dead at the time of their experience and sometimes they can meet a being of light and this being of light could be associated with a culture so in the west they're more likely to see images of christ whereas in the east they're more likely to see images of yama the god of the dead and uh, they're very happy where they are all pain disappears it's very peaceful comforting and they're very relaxed and they want to stay there and sometimes they're told that they have to go back it's not their time Sometimes they can even have a life review as well, and they can see the whole of their life played before their eyes, almost in like a panoramic view, and everything's happening at once. So they can see the significant things in their life, the insignificant things, and the interesting thing about the life review is that they can see things often from a third person perspective as well. So they can feel like what it's like to be on the receiving end of their actions. Uh, there's a really good case uh, where there was a man who punched someone and he said he felt, well, during his life review, he felt lo what it was like to feel that, pu that punch, to feel the humiliation, to, to feel what it was like to be on the floor. And it made him think very deeply then when he returned to life. So you get those kind of aspects with the 
life review. Um, after the experience, the person is usually profoundly transformed in many ways, and they're really noticeable transformations as well. Very prevalent, it's uh, no fear of death at all. They say that they've been there before, and it, when it's their time, they won't be afraid. It's not that they want to die, they just say that when it's their time, they know they won't be afraid. Um, very often they can become more altruistic, more compassionate, more loving. Some of them even change their careers and they completely like, change everything about them. Their personality changes and sometimes like their career, whereas before they're very money orientated, very materialistic. It's the simple things in life that take precedent, like spending time with their family. Um, and then some of them change careers to become carers or nurses and things like that. Um, so it's interesting, what you're saying is that um, perhaps a recognition of one's own mortality makes you live life more fully. Yes, exactly. And um, that's exactly what they do. You know, yes. You know, they realise that perhaps, you know, the way I've been living my life was in a very unfulfilled way. And all of a sudden it's, it's like they're faced with themselves totally and everything turns around for them and they're deeply transformed. It's interesting because the ancient Greeks used to say, know thyself. And I suppose it's a bit like that, isn't it? Yeah, it is. That's right. You know, they literally go within and they really contemplate everything in a very acute, fast way as well. You know, you've got to take it into consideration. These experiences are happening in a matter of seconds sometimes. You know, a person can have a cardiac arrest. They'll be flatlined for maybe a minute or so, sometimes longer. But the extent of their experience would take far longer in real time to unfold than what it does in that short space of time that they're unconscious. And so that's a really interesting aspect of the experience as well. Yeah, I mean, I noticed, I, I seem to remember one of the courses I attended, mm -hmm. you told a story about somebody um, where, the rel where people saw um, a dead relative who they didn't know was dead at the time. Mm -hmm. Or that somebody sort of, if you like, had a telepath, almost had a telepathic image, a me a message that somebody they knew was dying. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you want to tell us a little bit about anything there? Yes, there was one man in my study actually. Um, he'd had a cardiac arrest at home and collapsed, transferred to hospital, ended up in intensive care. Prognosis was very bad, he wasn't expected to survive, and the family were unsure what to do because he had an elderly mother who was in hospital and she was about 40 miles away in a different hospital. Um, after much family debate, they decided that they would go up and tell his mother what had happened because it looked like he was going to die. And as soon as the family approached the bed area of his mother, she said, I know why you're here. I know. And she said, it's my son, isn't it? Something's not, wrong, not right with him. She said, at 8 o'clock that morning, he'd appeared in a ball of light at her bedside, dressed in white robes, and he was communicating to her as if he was trying to say goodbye and he was saying I'm not well mum and it's as if he'd gone there to say goodbye and she was convinced that something had happened to him and that coincided with the time that he did have the cardiac arrest so how, how can we explain that mm. you know 40 that's miles different and she picked up on that so there's something that's going on with our understanding of consciousness that we don't quite understand yet you know it, it is interesting and it's almost as if if you like a rigid scientific view can't explain this mm. so it dismisses that's right. These sorts of things. Yeah, if you look at it from a scientific perspective, it says that our consciousness is created mm. by the brain. So when your brain stops functioning, there should be no conscious experience. But these near-death experiences are showing that, yes, there is conscious experience. We don't understand the mechanism of it yet, and it's easier to kind of dismiss it because it doesn't fit in with our science at the moment. But when you do study it scientifically, we have to be more open-minded to these experiences now. It's no good dismissing them. We're doing hospital studies, and these hospital studies are giving us some very interesting data. So I think it's more about kind of opening up our minds and being more aware that we don't know all the answers, mm. and we have a lot more research to do. So it's essentially, a, 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 if you like, a, a perspective that needs to be looked at. Yes. It isn't being probably looked at. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think some of your work, say, in a hospice, in a, mm -hmm. with people who are dying, I, I, I seem to remember you telling me a story at one point about a man 
whose uh, paralysed hand, he hadn't moved his hand. Yes, that's right. That's another man who was in my study and this is the strongest case. Um, I was actually looking after the man on the day that it happened. And um, he was recovering from a very serious illness, criti critical illness. And on this day we put him to sit in a chair. He became deeply unconscious. His condition deteriorated rapidly. We got him back into bed and by the time he was in bed, he was deeply, deeply unconscious, not responding to deep painful stimuli, not responding to us calling him. And his Glasgow coma score was the lowest it could be, it was 3 out of 15, which signifies the, the lowest level of unconsciousness. And um, after about 30 minutes, he began to kind of recover a bit, flicker his eyelids and move his limbs. And then after four hours, he completely regained consciousness and as the doctors approached his bed area, he described what had been done and he said he couldn't speak because he was ventilated by a tracheostomy. So the, the physiotherapist got a letter board and he spelled out, I died and I watched it from above. And so the consultant on the ward and said, oh, you'd better tell Penny about that. And um, they, everyone listened to what he said and um, when I interviewed him, this patient described everything that we had done to him during the time when he was deeply unconscious. That was before the first 30 minutes where he started to move around. So he correctly identified the consultant as having examined him and not the other doctors that he'd seen previously. He correctly um, described what I did to clean his mouth with a pink sponge lollipop stick. And he correctly identified the physiotherapist poking her head around the curtains looking very nervous and indeed every one of those things happened and I know because I was actually there at the time it was happening but he was deeply unconscious at the time he was experiencing this. Further to the out of body experience he then went upwards into what he described as a pink room and in this pink room was his dead father, um, his dead mother-in-law who he'd never met but he recognised from photographs and there was another man and he said, I'm not sure who this man was, it could have been Jesus, but his hair was long and scruffy and it needed a good combing. But his eyes were very piercing and he said, I was drawn to look at his eyes and um, I was so happy and comfortable where I was, I wanted to stay there. And then he said, all of a sudden my father was calling me and saying, and as I went to cross over to go with my father, the Jesus type figure said, no, it's not his time, he has to go back. And he said he could feel himself drifting backwards into his body and the image faded gradually before his eyes. And he said as soon as he was back in his body, he was in immediate pain. You know, it was really, really excruciating pain. And that kind of as well goes against the endorphin theory. You know, a lot of people would say this is due to endorphin release within the body. Whereas with the endorphins, they have a long lasting effect. So with this patient, he was in immediate pain. So if it was solely due to mm. endorphins, I would, I would have expected a gradual onset of pain, but it wasn't, it was immediate. But then, when I followed this man up then, um, I asked him if there was anything he could do when he was out of his body that he can't normally do. Now by that, I was getting at some people um, report when they have an out-of-body experience, they can think of a place say the pyramids of Egypt and they will end up there looking over them so that's what I was getting at but he misinterpreted my question and he said oh yeah look at this I can open my hand now he has cerebral palsy so he was 60 years of age at the time of his experience and his right hand is in a permanently contracted position so it's kind of in this position normally that's its normal position but after the experience he can now open it out fully and at first I didn't understand the significance of this, but I was discussing it with the doctors and the physios and they said that that shouldn't be possible because his, hat, his tendons would be in a permanently contracted position. So in order to open them out, he'd have to have an operation to release the tendons, but nothing of that kind was done at all. So that defies physiological explanation at the moment. How that has happened, we don't fully understand. That's fascinating that there's all these different sorts of explanations. What do you think that these studies of um, near-death experience have any effects or implications for say, religion as a whole or how we look at things? And I don't want to get you into any controversial uh -huh. waters, um, but I just, just wondered if you felt there was perhaps 
a widening of consciousness at the moment? I think so. I think things are changing very much. And I think one thing that I've noticed that is very much in common with all religions is it's the message of the near-death experience. Mm. After the person has had a near-death experience, they profoundly transformed in many ways. And it's as if the message that they give out is treat others as you would wish to be treated yourself. And that is the underlying thing of all of the wisdom traditions mm. and every religion. It's a golden rule, isn't it? it and is. it's not as if it's been set down as a, as a rule. It's kind of a way of life. And if you behave in a way like that, life goes smoothly kind of thing. It is, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it gives the idea that everybody's experience of hell or heaven, mm -hmm. um, that for somebody every day it's judgment day or it's um, somebody's perception of a greater sense of awareness in their life. Yes, that's right. Uh, so perhaps uh, perhaps we're sort of uh, widening our perspective. Mm -hmm. And perhaps science and religion are both attempts to explain the world, but yes. there's something else happening. Yes, well. that's right. And I think, I think that what we're seeing now are big changes in our science, and it's, it's starting to kind of embrace these kind of things now. We are studying these in a scientific way and I think we live in really exciting times and for me I can see science and spirituality going mm. hand in hand and I think that's the best way of understanding what it, what it means to be human yes. and I think the two of them going hand in hand is the way forward and I think science has something to offer and spirituality does so to have them both together it's a very powerful way for our evolution I think. Do you think near-death experiences have any explanation, say, in hauntings or, um, or odd patterns of, if you like, energy discovered in particular places? Um, well, when someone is having a near-death experience mm. and they're picking up on people who they didn't know to be dead at the time, mm. that kind of makes you mm. think, well, is that kind of analogous to what people are seeing when they see a ghost and mm. things like that? So. I don't know really, I haven't kind of explored that aspect as much as I could have really. I've concentrated mainly on the near-death experiences, but these people are certainly picking up on things that other people around them aren't aware of. And as a nurse, you know, I, I've witnessed many patients have deathbed visions, and usually one to two days before they actually die, they may start communicating with people that we can't see. And, you know, there's one man in my research and myself and my colleagues on a night shift, we witnessed him communicating, smiling at someone, and he was mouthing the words, what are you doing here? And we all watched it and everyone kind of commented on how peaceful and happy he looked. And the following day when his relatives visited him, he told them that during the night his mother and his grandmother had visited and also his sister was with them. And they were quite amazed that they, he'd mentioned his sister because, in fact, his sister had died the week before, but they hadn't told him that. They wanted to keep it from him so that it didn't sort of set back his recovery and upset him. So, you know, how, how did he pick up on that, you know? I know what's interesting, isn't it? it, it it's basically arguing that we must respect um, the dying process as a process similar to being born. Yes. It's as mysterious as... As that. And Cardiff, do you know anything about say historical figures who've had near death experiences or you could sort of comment on um, anything like there's a lot of them in the literature really. You look yeah. you look back at Plato and in yeah. the Republic he describes the uh, experience of Air, the soldier who awoke on his funeral pyre. Um, you look at some of the great mystics and they all had very similar experiences to a near death experience itself. So if you look throughout history, you do see evidence of near-death experiences having occurred. So yeah, and in the medieval literature, mm. for example, Carol Zaleski has written a book mm. called Medieval Other World Journeys, and that's full of kind of the experiences of a near-death experience, you know, interpreted in a very different way, in more of a kind of um, sinister way, if anything, more like um, very um, hell-like imagery in some cases. But, um, yeah, you, you can see them throughout history. So they're not new, mm. and it was only in 1975 that they became really popular when Dr. Raymond Moody published the book Life After Life. And it's after then that they really gained popularity. But it's only in the last 10, 15 years that they've actually been scientifically studied in the hospital setting. So we're making new discoveries all the time. So, so you did it so you did a PhD in this. How did you, what, what sort of... 
I mean, that would have been a very much an experience. How, how was that personally transforming, or? Oh yeah, very much transforming. It completely changed my life, and um, it's opened my eyes to things that I didn't really understand, didn't think were possible, and it's almost as if I've been changed in much the same way as someone who's had a near-death experience themselves. It's really informed the way I live my life. Everything about my life is completely different and um, I think I'm a lot more happier as a result of undertaking my research and I would say I, I follow more of a spiritual path than I ever did before. I always used to think spiritual things were all airy-fairy but now having employed some of these principles in my life it, it's a way of life for me now so my life is very different and I feel very enriched through doing my study. And I think what's interesting is that you're now teaching courses on spirituality mm -hmm. and health uh, yeah. and science at Swansea University. How did that yes. come about? Um, that came about because I, I met one of the lecturers and he was very much aware of my PhD mm. and um, he kind of said, well, you should think about teaching this. And it was something that I wanted to do anyway. So I started to think about it and I started to formulate courses then. So I wrote two modules and um, they've been really much more successful than I anticipated. So I've really enjoyed doing it. Excellent. So if you wanted to find out more about the near-death experience, what sort of experiments, what sort of research, what sort of observations would you need? And if people wanted to contact you about that? Oh yeah, I'm always open for people yeah. contacting me. I'm always, I'd love to hear anyone's experience. So please contact me through my website. Um, if you wanted to know more about near-death experiences, there's loads of resources out there. And I think future research would be, it's really beneficial to do it in the hospital setting because you have the backup of different things to verify how close to death the person was, were they given any drugs, what was their blood gas status at the time. So those are really important scientific aspects. But there's other ways that we can research it as well and we can compare different experiences that people have. We can look at the after effects. Some of them are quite measurable as well, and something that particularly interests me is that some people who have a near-death experience appear to have changes in their electromagnetic field. And some people can't wear wristwatches for no reason. They've worked for them up until the point of their experience. After the near-death experience, they stop working, but they'll work for other people. And electrical items such as computers, kettles, toasters, they'll kind of malfunction in their presence. Um, light bulbs will, will blow in their presence as well. So that is something that is potentially quantifiable as well. So we could measure those effects. And so that is something that really interests me as well. That is interesting. It's, mm -hmm. um, is that sort of under... So what would you simply say to a sceptic who said this is all airy-fairy nonsense? Well, How would you refute that? I would think, I would really say we, we need to have an open mind on these things and there's certainly things that I've come across through doing the research that has really made me think, well I couldn't explain that, I tried my hardest to explain this or explain it away and I couldn't. So I, it's taught me that I've had to have an open mind and I think mm. it's, it's good to have a sceptical perspective as well, it's very important. And I think the way forward would be to have someone who is highly sceptical uh, working with near-death experience researchers as well because then we can bounce ideas off each other and work together to get a greater understanding of consciousness. Yes, I think it's very interesting because I've always been a firm believer in something else mm -hmm. but I try to maintain a rigid scepticism at times. I'm looking for those 20% of cases that you can't explain uh -huh. for other reasons and I, I think my father had a near-death experience mm -hmm. uh, after um, some thirty, nearly 30 years ago now, um, where he actually did die six months later, where he actually met the Greek gods uh, at a hunting lodge and they told him he wasn't required yet. And what, what interests me is that what you said is about all those different e relative experiences to different beliefs and different cultures. Mm -hmm. And perhaps it's, do you think it's likely that what's actually going on? is, if you like, tailored for what we believe, how we believe it, and where we are at what particular time in history. Yes, I think it is very much so. And um, Carl Jung had the theory of archetypes and the collective unconscious. And I think perhaps when we're entering into this altered state of consciousness, which happens during a near-death experience, you're perceiving archetypes according to your cultural um, conditioning. And so what I would perhaps see as one thing, you might view it mm. as something else. 
So I think perhaps we're accessing this altered state of consciousness and perceiving it according to our own cultural perceptions and filters. Yes, because I remember working with a particular guy who was, we used the word magician, it was the idea, he was, um, it was a, a guided visualisation and I asked him to describe the magician. He was a guy who lived in South Africa for many years and the magician figure was effectively a tribal shaman who appeared out of a cave. Right. Whereas in, perhaps in this country, people might perceive a magician as a, as a Merlin-like figure. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's right. And I, I think it's interesting how that near-death experience has gradually crept into, into films like mm -hmm. Ghost yes, and so on. Yes, that's right, yes. So, you know, is there anything you'd like to finally add about your research, Benny, you'd like to tell us? Uh, I think that there's, there's big changes coming along, definitely. You know, in the, when I first started doing my research, when I did talks, very often at the end of the talk, someone might come up to me and say, hey, I had this experience, can I share it with you? What I've realised now, especially in the last two years, particularly this year, I've done a lot of public speaking for the university. And at the end of the talks, I've been surprised at how many people in the audience are actually sharing the experience with everyone in the audience. So people, I think, are becoming more accepting of these experiences and they're less afraid to share the experience as well. So I think that that is a real big difference. And it's, it's very much affirming for people who are in the audience as well because they feel reassured that they can kind of talk about their experiences now and people won't think that they're crazy because they're not. These are real experiences that happen to them. I think it's very interesting what you're saying there with that. Uh, Penny will be talking at the Swansea Philosophy Society next month on having a good life, having a good death. And you might get a little bit of controversy there. And I believe you did have some controversy at a recent talk you gave at, um, at the uh, Grand Theatre in Swansea. I did, yes, yes. But, you, but the guy had summoned the Archbishop of Canterbury the year <laughs> before. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the most, say, the more hostile times? Uh, yeah, well, very often, you know, you do get people who don't kind of agree with what I've been saying. And that's fine, you know, everyone has their own entitlement to their own opinions, and that is absolutely fine. I'm not trying to change anyone's mind or anything. What I'm doing is presenting the findings of my research. I think that they're really beneficial for other people, and people who uh, have heard about these experiences or, or who have had an experience and not quite understood it have been re very reassured through listening to my talks. So I'm not trying to kind of you know, change anyone's mind or anything. It's about being open and sort of doing your own research into it and reading around the subject as well. I'm not trying to say no. I have all the answers. I don't no. have all the answers. And there's a lot more research that has to be done as well. Yes, you're not being a missionary. You're more of an explorer. No. That's it, exactly. And a postulator of ways. Mm. I've got a curious mind. Yes, yes. I think it. And I think when you're curious, um, you, you're always on the right thing. Yes. Okay, Penny, thank you very much for... Okay, for explaining welcome. and talking about this. You're welcome. Thank you very much.